Arkansas Arids program about a year and a half ago uh, through the Extreme History Project out of Bozeman. And uh, it was, not to put more pressure on them, but it was probably the, one of the best programs I've seen in the last couple of years. It was heart-wrenching, it was personal, and it really is, uh, I wanted him to come also at this point in time, May, whatever this is, May 25th or so, I have no idea, uh, because the uh, Crow exhibit, uh, the National Crow exhibit is opening at the Museum of the Rockies on May 28th. And uh, a lot of his work deals with that, all of the Chicago Field Museum's uh, collection of shields uh, are leaving Illinois for the first time, as far as I know, in over 100 years. So if you get a chance, Museum of the Rockies, from May 28th through December 20, uh, 31st, that exhibit will be here. It'll be a once in a lifetime experience. Aaron will set the context for us without further ado. Uh, and I do have a mic if you want. Uh, Maybe I, I'll use it because I'm okay. I'm rather hoarse. Okay, yeah, and just this won't mess up this, right? No, nope, you're good. Nope, you're okay, good. and I'll be right here. I always feel funny holding the microphone. Like I don't know if you're supposed to do it with two hands or <laughs> one hands are like like this. Um, all right, well, thanks for having me. Sorry, I I was late. Um, I I was proud of myself because I left at 11 and I was like, hey, I'm gonna be there on t in time, and, and then I forgot my computer. So then I had to turn around at Fly Creek and then come back. So I made it. I think I did pretty good considering I had to turn around. So, But thanks for having me. Thanks for being patient. I apologize. I feel really bad about it because I pride myself in being punctual, which I am not today. So, All right. Well, we'll just jump right into it because I understand some people have to leave, right? Uh, What's that? People just have to leave, but I just don't want you to think they're they're leaving because they're upset or anything, right? And just, they have a bus tour, so that's why. So. This is better than the tour bus. I mean, we're, I'm going to blow the tour bus out of the water. I'm, oh, we could do that too. We'll do our own Yellowstone Valley deal. Uh, all right, so a couple years ago, I, uh, uh, another Crow curator reached out to me and, and asked me, this is prior to my position now as the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. And, and said, hey, we want you to come and look at these shields with a, with a group of crows, kind of a delegation to go over there to Chicago to look at some of these items. And they, they didn't really give me much background on what I was going to see. They just said, hey, come look at these items. They, so they flew me out there, which was kind of cool. So this is the Chicago Field Museum. If, if no one's ever fe seen that, it, it's, a, it's a very intimidating structure. It looks like the Supreme Court or something. So. This is not a detailed study. This is more of a survey of some of the shields. It gives you a sense of what's there and then the connection to the people. So that's really what this was intended for. So the Field Museum ended up with these shields through this fella, uh, S.C. Sims, in the summer of 1902 and then partially actually in 1903, but he purchased um, 44 shields, only paying $591 for them, which is pretty remarkable. Um, he identified 30 of them. He, uh, four, uh, 30 of them, 14 of them were not identified, which is kind of weird in itself too. Like, why wouldn't they be? Like, where would he get them then? So there's some question there. Um, that's equivalent in 2020 to $17,000, which is still pretty cheap considering that there had been, there was the sore belly shield was auctioned off for a uh, million dollars, I think is what it was. So, and that's him. And just to give you a sense of what, how this impacted the reservation in 1903, 1902, Robert Lowy, one of the most famous crow anthropologists, or anthropologists to study the crows came and he basically said that there was really nothing left of Shields by the time he got there. And he was there in the teens and in, in the 20s. So, and that's just what he says. Um, the previous purchase on the reservation was made by G.A. Dorsey, who at the time was the curator for the Field Museum, and C.S. Sims, who was working in the field. So uh, Sims eventually becomes the curator for the Field Museum. That's Robert Lowy. He looks like a vampire, doesn't he? <laughs> like a stereotypical vampire, like from those old movies. I'm gonna take my hat off, I feel weird wearing my hat. So 
So I was there for a total of 14 days over the, uh, uh, the summer of 2020 and in the winter of t our 2019 and 2020. So uh, what I did is I went there on my own at one point and I had all the shields to myself and I looked at them, studied them. And then I went there with a crow elder and we looked at them and did the same thing. Then I had taken high resolution images and came back to Crow and uh, interviewed and, and visited with quite a few people about shields and then things related to shield culture. So the intent was I was going to write a book. I have since changed my mind, at least right now, but that was the, in, the intent. So here's some of the images of the shields. So just to give you a sense, these, are, these were not altered. These were not like enhanced or, or anything. The colors on the shields are vibrant, like really vibrant. So, and they've just been in this room since 1903. Some of them seen the exhibit space. Some were traded with, the Ameri uh, with uh, in DC with the Smithsonian. Some, but overall, the majority of the collection is still in Chicago. That was a, that's a film, but we're going to skip that because, did I go too far? Okay, no. I'm messing everything up here. Okay, so these are some of the people I would talk to and visit with. Uh, a lot of these individuals are no longer here, so um, we lost a few to COVID, but um, over the years, I've been actively studying my own people since I was about 16 years old, like c keeping records. And, and so I have my own little archive. It drives my wife crazy because I get obsessed with like certain things and then I forget my duties in life. So here's some images that I, th I threw together of shields. Um, even me, myself, growing up in, in Crow and, and studying Crow people, I, I had a pretty miss our, our misunderstood idea of what shields were and how they were used. And one of the things is that they're not held on the arm. Who, who in here thought they were held on the arm? I, I did. I, I completely thought that. They're not held on the arm. What gives them that look, this ain't a pointer, huh? It has a pointer. I don't want to touch it because I'll mess it all up and we might start watching baseball or something. <laughs> um, well, if you look at this guy, both these individuals that are holding the shields in front of them, what makes it appear that way is they're like a bandolier. They're, they're like a satchel. And so you can move it, you can manipulate it up and down, and even it can appear to be like a backpack. So um, shields were kept in the home, uh, mainly cared for by the women, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But um, if you look at the image of, uh, his name is Goes Ahead, right there with the bow and arrow, he's holding the shield typically how a shield would be held. It's kind of over the shoulder, like a, like a satchel. So That was like the first thing. The second thing was how they're made. Who in here thought they were built around a frame? Me. I did too. I completely thought they were built on a frame. Like they put like a wooden frame and they would stretch a hide over it. That's not the case. Um, here's the back of the shield, the front of the shield. They're made from a single piece of hide, and I'll get into that. But here, and they also have a, the part called the shield cover. This is probably what people are thinking of when they think of a shield. This is the thing that's stretched over it, but it's only the cover. It covers the shield. So how they were made was they would take the... Um, not, I say the thickest part of a buffalo, but it's not necessarily the thickest. It's the part that has the most potential to be the thickest. So what they would do it was they would create a rawhide out of it and then dig a hole. They would either place a fire in there and wait till it's just hot embers, or they would take hot stones and place them in there. They would stretch the hide over it, and that fire would pull all the moisture out of the hide, and it would shrink it making it thicker. So some of the shields were almost three-fourths of an inch thick. So, so they're made from a single piece of hide. And they're, they're, there's a bow in them, 
kind of a, they look like a wok, you know, like how you cook. Uh, they would place rocks in there as it was sh uh, shrinking, and, and it would create that bowl effect in it. And the bowl faces out, not in. So when you're holding it, it's, it looks like a satellite. And that's to reduce chafing. So Shields were commonly inherited by the father to the son. But um, there are cases where the widow would have the shield because the, the owner passed away and she would be in charge with it and then she could hand it down. So under NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, this would qualify under two of the four qualifications, which is an item of patrimony and a sacred object. So the individual that this shield belongs to is sitting to the right of Chief Plenty Coos in there. His name is Bull Snake. So the first shield we kinda, I kind of like to get into is I'm a descendant of this guy. His name is Charges Strong. He's the one standing uh, on, on the, I don't even know what side, on my left, right? They look the same height to me. <laughs> I would say the one, the one that looks like an Indian. I was like, I don't even know. This guy right here, this guy right here. Charge is strong. Um, a lot of his descendants now live in the prior area, except for my grandmother's bunch. We, all, we live on what the prior people would call the other side, so we live in the Little Bighorn Valley. Um, he was a member of the Lumpwood War Warrior Society. So these societies were policing agencies for the tribe. And there was the Lumpwoods, the Foxes, the Muddy Hands, and then there was a society for retired warriors called the Big Dogs, which is a pretty cool name. He was the owner, uh, or he carried the war leader's pipe seven times. And what this means is you're kind of like the field general. So you're the leader of the war party. And you're, you're, you can only count that if you come back successful, meaning that no one was harmed. So you can carry the pipe 20 times, but if you're not successful, they just say, well, he, he was the guy in charge and they didn't. So it's not talked about. But if he, so for them to say he carried the pipe seven, si seven times implies he was successful seven times, which is pretty remarkable. Um, he was best known for his um, contributions at the Battle of Rosebud. So he, there's a, a cairn there at the headwaters of Rosebud Creek. Um, um, where he, what they say, sh counted a war deed. So he struck the enemy there. So it's still there, from what I understand. On the shield itself, you can see uh, little dots on the side. Those little uh, dots represent weasel tracks. And these weasel tracks, uh, crows highly value beings that can live in two realms, or two worlds, right? Us humans, we can only live on the earth. We can't live under it. We can't live in the sky. We can't live in the water. We're, we're limited. So animals like an otter, right, could live in the water and live on the earth, are highly valued in a traditional crow way of thinking. That's why birds are considered sacred, because they can live in the sky and they can live on the ground. So we, we cannot. So a lot of these warrior people, these warriors, their spiritual helper were, were those things that can do those things, live in separate realms. So the weasel is one of them. The green, the big green dots represent weasel holes. And then those kind of lightning bolt looking things, those represent each time he came home successful from battle. In the traditional Crow Warriors homecoming, which they actually still do this at the airport, and I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but they'll do this at the airport where they'll sing the bringing home of the Warriors songs. Well, where that comes from is these, when Warriors would come home successful, they would enter the camp in a zigzag fashion, so on their way in. And that tells the camp that, hey, so-and-so is coming. 
he's coming zigzag. That means he either spotted the enemy, he stole some horses, he counted a war deed. So to prepare the camp for the warrior's homecoming and the victory celebration. So each time those, those dots represent a time he did that. He did one of those things. He, and there's four major war deeds for the crows. There's the capturing of the enemy's weapon, the touching of an enemy without killing him, the leading of a successful war party, and the capturing of a picketed horse, which means it's tied to the, to the owner's camp. So. And the color yellow, it was personal to him. So a lot of times they would go out and they would have dreams or they, they and we'll get into that where these things come from. But so those colors are individual. They're very personal. They're not like a tribal, tribally known thing a lot of the times. Oh, you say his, um, you say his name, Alahuwa Chaj. And that means to like charge great or charge strong. So charge something, you know. The next shield, I'm also a descendant of. This individual is not a woman, it's a man. Um, was the father to Pretty Shield, a famous Crow Indian woman. There's a book about her. This is actually the shield she's named after. So it's pretty cool to see, but... Pretty Shield is the woman who raised my grandmother her first 11 years of life. So she died in 1944. Um, she was born in 1856. So this is her father. So this shield goes back quite a ways before the Duttons came to Montana. I'm over that stuff, man. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's like a timeline now. Now we're going to judge Montana time based on that TV series. So crazy sister-in-law, Wugbalaka means like a, literally means crazy sister-in-law. We, we don't know where the name comes from or it's, it's quite a ways back, but he received a spiritual power, a medicine that was the burrowing owl. So the owl, he referred to it as the long-legged owl that lives in the ground. Um, he said that it was given to him by the Creator himself, which wasn't always the case. Sometimes they would say, the Morning Star gave this to me, or the Big Dipper gave this to me, the Moon, the Sun. But he says it was Egypt Balia, the Creator. So the first Maker gave me that burrowing owl. Um, he was one of the most respected war leaders of his time. And in fact, he was kind of the, the first advisor to the legendary two leggings later. And then two leggings would later on be advised under a different person, but it was crazy sister-in-law at first. So he achieved the rank of a pipe owner, uh, the one who carries the pipe, and, uh, which is a war leader. And he's one of the, not very many people can say they own a song, meaning when you achieve things in battle, they compose a song for you. And it's public, it's public. And all his descendants are allowed to use this song. And in the song it says, Crazy sister-in-law, you came close to them. Referring to the front line. And it says, you were wounded. Many times you were wounded. So we, our family has Crazy sister-in-law song. Which is a big deal for, it's kind of a point of pride, right? You can say, we have this many family songs, you know. Meaning you're a descendant of those people. Um... The black represents success in battle. There's rifles painted on there in red. Those red rifles represent a time he captured the enemy's weapon. Um, these are owl feathers painted yellow, which represent his spiritual power, as said earlier. Here's Pretty Shield, a picture of Pretty Shield, and she says, um, talking about her dad, he said, he painted his face and body with yellow zigzag patterns, making it difficult to see him. And what my grandma tells me is that those yellow lines represented heat waves. So you know when you look out in the distance and you see those heat waves? That's what it represented. That's why it made, she said that, it, concealment. Um, and he wore the stuffed skin of a long-legged owl tied to his head and sang his medicine song, which says, I am the bird among the prairie dogs. 
So the belief is that these feathers that he tied to his head came from the shield, so he, which is a common practice. The crow warriors would take a piece of the shield off, carry it with, the, with them in battle. The next shield belongs to probably one of the most famous crows to ever live. He, he's, he's the only crow to lead a rebellion against the government or he was part of a rebellion. The leader was actually named Crazy Head, but Chishtabadiyash wraps up his tail, um, and it's referring to a horse's tail. They would tie the horse's tail in a bundle as they went into battle. So that's what he's named after. He was given the nickname the Sword Bearer because he carried a red sword, which is now in Harlequin at that little museum there. Yeah, at least that's what I'm told. I've never seen it, but... Um, and it does have red, red pigment, apparently, on the handle. So wraps up his tail, was born around 1860. He died in 1887 in a famous way. He was killed by a Crow police officer as part of this rebellion. And that in itself, there's a book called um, Swordbearer Incident by Cal Cummin. And he, it came out a couple years ago, but it's about this whole incident. But... Um, he was well known. Uh, the crows, a lot of the crows, especially of a particular band called the Kickin' the Billies, they revered him because he, they, he was seen as someone protecting the people. His rebellion started because the agent was withholding rations, and so people were starving. So he would go and he would advocate for his people, he, and, and it would only make things worse. So, so it got to the point where only his followers were not getting rations so um, he decided that he was going to fast and he fasted in a place in the Wolf Mountains that is still known to the crows and he carved his image into the sandstone and it's still there in fact two weeks ago or no about a month ago me and my crew drove out there and just checked it out and we use it kind of as like an, how to do site monitorings for our program so it's out there in, in the Wolf Mountains it's on private land, or you have to go through private land to get to it, so. Um, the shield contains the image of, I say thrown behind the TB liner, but um, it, there's two brothers, thrown behind the TB liner and thrown into the spring, and eventually they became um, the stars, two stars. And this is an old time crow story that has to do with these two, these twin brothers who attack and, and kill monsters and, and kind of clear the way for crow people to live. Um, I actually think it's thrown into the spring, but. Um, so the image kind of looks scary, but it, he, he, the, the image is of one of those twins. And the cranes, you were used by the twins to guide them to where they were going so that you know you it's common to see the crane on these shields with those twin figures the sore belly shield which is um another well-known shield has a, a similar image and a crane on it as well but it's not part of this talk um he becomes venus so at the end they they decide to become the stars, and we refer to them as, as, those are planets, but we refer to them as stars, you know. So he becomes Venus. That way he's always, they're always with us. And again, the cranes were guided to the, used as guides. Um, what, when Rapsis Tell was given this shield, this was handed down to him from a guy named He Dog, and he, it was white. The image was white, and Rapsis Tell painted it red because that was kind of his color that he used a lot so and this is a drawing of Rapsis tail this is the only known photo that I've ever come across of Rapsis tail there was another one but it's miscategorized it's really a, a visiting Nez Perce guy that comes to crow but um these these men were later arrested this group of men right here so But just to give you a sense of who he was, he was under the guidance of a man named Crazy Head, Chief Crazy Head, who was kind of an anti-government guy. But 
he also participated in Cheyenne ceremonies, so uh, wraps up his tail would go over and participate in the doings of the Northern Cheyenne. So he was influenced heavily by them, influenced heavily by Crazy Head. So, but he's just young enough to miss most of the intertribal warfare. So he grew up in a time where he was anxious to do something that he couldn't do. It was illegal. So this opportunity arose, and I think he was, he was not only guided by his spiritual power, but he was also an anxious. What was that? Your speaker doesn't want me to talk about Raps' tale. But the Billings, there's actually a newspaper, the New Billings paper wrote about that incident quite a bit during that time. So if you ever get bored and you want to hit the archives, it's worth a read. Because it, it really freaked everybody out when it happened. They thought the, a, a whole civil war was going to happen or something. So, um, The next guy is Two Leggins. Two Leggins is a pretty famous Crow Indian. There's a book about him called The Making of, the Crow, of a Crow Warrior. Um, his shield is pretty cool. And this is one of the shields that will be in Bozeman, along with crazy sister-in-laws. Um, this is just the cover, though. So his shield was unique, where the shield itself had nothing, no design on it, but the cover did. And it's pretty common for it to be the other way around, where the shield has the design and then it was covered. So he also he achieved a pretty high rank. He was considered a band chief of the River Crows, also known as the Black Lodges. Um, his shield has the hand star on it, which is the Orion's belt now. And then um, the black line represents what we call dark face time, which is the darkest time of the night, which is before you start to see light, but the sun ain't out. It's super, so it's about four in the morning. So, and they say it's the holiest time. That's, maybe, maybe God's like an early riser, and like that's the time you want to get to him or something. That was a dumb joke, I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, so Two Leggins was well known for his spiritual power. In fact, he's the guy that is known for placing a curse on Hardin's Little Bighorn days. And this, is all, this could be a whole different talk, but they, they kicked him out of the rodeo, so he said, I'm going to, you know, you'll never be able to enjoy your rodeo, and it's going to rain. And I think it's rained every year on, on the radio, rodeo. So, yeah, so if you want to see it in action, come down this year, so. Um, the, in, in the story of the twins, Lodge Boy and Spring Boy, they kill, uh, um, in one version they kill Red Woman, in one version they kill Long Arm, but either way they cut the hand off, throw it into the sky. Um, that's what the hand star is, but the eagles kind of were guides in that story too, so that's what the two eagle feathers represent. So... This is a picture that Sims took of him carrying the shield in 1902. But he was the guy that kind of got rid of this idea that I, th I thought shields were always carried into battle. That wasn't always the case. It, in fact, it's hit or miss. It's not very consistent about who's taking a shield into battle versus who's not. He says he tried to take it into, the, into battle um, one time and it just chafed his arm the whole time so he threw the shield away took the cover off and threw the shield away because it just was cumbersome and, and kind of in the way so that's a pretty neat um, picture that's right on the Little Bighorn River so also taken by Sims the next shield is also a shield I'm a descendant from from my my grandfather Ben Big Man this was his grandfather so um, he was born in 1851, Spotted Tail. He was also achieved the rank of a pipe carrier. Uh, this shield was said to be handed down five generations from the time he got it. It's also the largest shield in the collection. It's quite a bit bigger um, than the other shields. Um, it, this will be in Chicago. The main image on the shield is of a buffalo, which we call the buffalo above, which is Taurus, the constellation. It's the same constellation. Um, those, uh, 
lines still represent the returning of a warrior. We don't know exactly everything that is, is um, mentioned on the shield. Sims does take notes and says, says, this is what Spotted Tail told me. I question it a little bit only because of the translation and, and some of it doesn't really make sense if you compare what our family knows about Spotted Tail and it just, it doesn't, ju so I don't put it in there. Not because I'm saying he's lying, I just, I haven't confirmed it yet, so. I'm saying he's lying. I, uh, let's just face it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'll talk more about this shield later. But um, this is the, probably the most famous Crow Indian medicine man ever. His name is Seize the Living Bull. And in the story where he fasts at the Bare Tooth Mountains, he, he'll go, fasting culture is pretty important to the Crow people even today, so we'll talk about that here in a second. But he goes and fasts for four days, no food and water, no shelter, doesn't receive a dream or anything, so he takes a one-day break, goes back up, does it again. He does that four times. So for a total of 16 days, he went without food and water. And on the last day, he said the sky blackened. And the buffalo above came to him and said, I'm going to give you this. So he gives him instructions on how to um, conduct himself and how to use this and how to build this shield. So that's why there's the image of the buffalo above on the shield. And those lines, like I said, represent... A few years ago, though, I did a project on the Battle of Arrow Creek here on Prior Creek. And just in passing, I kind of was talking to an individual and he was saying, you know, sees the living bull, he got wounded there. He was shot in the back. So then I talked to the great grandson of sees the living bull and he said, yeah, he, he was shot, but there was no marks. That's what he said, there was no marks. I said, well, where was he shot? He was shot in the back. So we know that these shields were carried like backpacks a lot of times if they were used in battle. And we're going to get to that here. But just to give you a sense, he was a mountain crow out of the three bands of the crows. Um, he was a successful pipe carrier, carrying the pipe 11 times. Um, seven times he brought back scalps. Four times he brought back horses. He rescued six men who were wounded in battle. And he was one of the principal leaders of Arrow Creek, that, the most famous Crow Indian battle where we were attacked by the combined forces of the Sioux, Cheyenne, and the Arapaho. So and we were able to fend them off. But we know that people wore these shields like backpacks. So my theory is he was wearing this backpack, or this shield in the Battle of Arrow Creek when he was shot. And there's two arrowheads still stuck in the shield today. And this shield, will, I think this is traveling to Bozeman as well. This is a pretty large shield too, but when I seen those arrowheads, I was like, whoa, it like blew me away. It's pretty remarkable when you see something like that. So all the imagery on these shields, there's 44 shields. I would say 39 of them have imagery, like strong imagery on them. But what you see a, a theme, a continued theme is the stars, constellations. One of the major constellations is the buffalo above, which is Taurus the bull. How you see those, why they see those is during that important time I was calling dark face time, is through the act of fasting. So these are two pictures of fasting beds in the prior mountains at a place they call where they saw the rope, which is now in the process of being eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. Um, it's East Prior Mountain, the Dryhead Vista is pretty much what it is. Um, we refer to fasting as bilashishanu. Bilashishanu means to like go without water. So they would build a bed like this, and they would lay boughs on the ground for for comfort, and they would sleep in there and pray in there for four days. And this is something we still do. Crows still do this today. So um, it's common for somebody to say, "Oh, so and so is sitting." went and sat on the mountain. So this is how this imagery and what we refer to as sacred objects are developed and formed is through the act of fasting, fasting and praying. Um, we refer to that as medicine, which is in a crow term, it's called bach ba, 
So something that's holy is bawakba, a holy thing. And those can be medicine bundles, shields, even bows and arrows, throwing arrows, even things you put on horses. It can be a, for a variety of things. There was a spiritual power for every aspect of crow life. Um, there's even spiritual power for gossip, to stop gossip. There's, so we, we had a mechanism for all aspects. Um, let's see here. This is a picture of shot in the hand. This shield is actually in the Brinton Museum down in Bighorn, Wyoming, in their, in their collection. But it's green. So this, this um, picture, the color was put in later, but the shield itself is green. It's not red. So I don't know how they would mix that up. But. So how these shields were handed, Medicine Crow gives us a sense of that. When Loey's talking to him, and he says that he raises the shield up and down four times and burns incense and then removes the cover. So he's kind of giving the sense that it's not something you just do. Like it's not a decoration. You don't just, you don't just show it to everybody. But um, here's a picture of Andrew Burdenground, the late Andrew Burdenground, putting uh, cedar onto live coals, which is fitting for what Medicine Crow's talking about here. So typically they would say a little prayer before they would open it or make a wish, they would say something like, I'm just going to look at you, we're not going to use you for anything, you know, like something like that, you would say. We believe holy objects are living, so you have to talk to them, interact with them. But anyone, any person that tells you that they, they own holy objects, are they, they're ceremonial people, understand the role of women in doing that. So here's some pictures of, of people doing, I don't know what you would call it, holy things, I guess. So on the bottom left, they're opening a medicine bundle, which you can't happen without the help of a woman. So they're a ceremonial partnership. The late Roger Stopp said that a man and wife act as a partnership in ceremonial life. So you have, for every every ceremony there's typically a major role filled by a woman in the crow sundance today like the, when the water is brought in at the end when we break our fast they're brought, it's brought in by the by a woman partly because she's the giver of life so they always say like we want to rejuvenate use a woman she'll rejuvenate because she can rejuvenate you know um, these two people in the bottom here are owners of the what we call the sacred pipe which comes from the big dipper I just thought it was a cool picture because they're kind of standing together and they're, they're seen as a pair. Up there belongs, they're individuals who belong to the Tobacco Society. But also here's a picture of a woman holding a shield, or the shield is placed on the horse, which it was considered an honor to be paraded with the items of a warrior. So if your husband or your dad was a respected person, if he paraded you, he would place his items on you, which is counter to what we hear like, there was a lot of stringent rules about men and women and things and all these like gender roles. There was a lot of overlap and a lot of praising of the other. And in fact, in a ceremony that's still done today called the Long Dance, it's part of the warrior's homecoming. When a warrior is going to be honored, he'll place a woman in front of him so the attention goes to her. And she's called Biowasa, the lead woman. And it's typically his sister-in-law. So kind of gives you a sense of that. And this picture was taken in the 90s, and these were still, this is how women dressed every day when I was young, these old ladies. There were still quite a few of them when I was a little guy. Um, they started to dwindle in the early 2000s. The last one was the late Ruth Alden. She passed away in, I believe, 2017. She was the last woman to dress that way. And my grandmother's older sisters, they all dressed like that. And I, they would be at the house, and, and so, it's kind of neat. It's a reflection of the last of that, those people who were, I consider kind of the last Crow Indians, but we're doing our best. We're working on it, you know. So specifically with the shields, though, Lowy is, record, is documenting some of this, and he says that the women would take the shields outside, place them on a tripod, and they would basically follow the sun. 
in the back of the lodge. So she would move it every once in a while and then she would bring it in in the evening. So here's the tripod and you can see on this one, which is the same image up there, that's the, there's a shield on the tripod and you can see the shield right there, along with all their other sacred objects. So. <clears throat> so Pretty Shield, like I said, I'm a descendant of Pretty Shield. And she says, my father's father gave me my name, Pretty Shield. So that shield crazy sister-in-law owned was owned by his dad prior to that. And um, what else? Oh, and according to our custom, my father gave me uh, this name on my fourth day of life. I was named after my grandfather's shield because she says because it was ha handsome, you know. So her name was Ishpinaja. Ishpinaja is the crow word for shield. Ishpinaja. But if you talk to most crow people, she wasn't known as that. Like, she was later known as Sitcha, which means thick. So that's how everybody called her. Even my grandma says, well, that's what everyone said. Uh, the white people called her Maggie. I don't know why. They just called her Maggie. So she's also known as Maggie Goes Ahead. So the reason I bring that up is because this is just to show you how the, the, the shields leaving our country affected the way Crow people are today. Because you, would, you wouldn't think that something like that would have a long-lasting effect. But um, in the story of the Big Dipper, the chief bull, or the, a bull will, will come up to this boy. They adopt this little boy, and they gourd him. They take their horns, and they throw him in the air. And when he lands on the ground, he starts to crawl. So the next bull comes up, and he does it again, and then the boy starts to walk. The third time he does it, then the boy starts to run. On the, on the fourth time, the leader of the bulls does that. When the boy lands, he says, you're now my son, and I'm going to call you Bijay Shigagya, Buffalo Boy. So he gives him the name. So today when crows name people, we'll take them and we'll throw them in the air four times, on the fourth time, then we'll say their name. This is what your name will be. The reason this is important is because people are named, especially in the Crow, traditional Crow society, they're named after the accomplishments of an individual or the spiritual power of an individual. And I, I gave an example on here of a child I was fortunate enough to name, and I named her Bawak Bajijiria, looks for sacred things. Because of what I do as an archaeologist, as a preservation officer, I named that little girl that. That's just an example. It's a little self-congratulatory, I know, but sorry. <laughs> so, in, in the time that Sims came, it would be common for people to be named after the holy object of the, the individual that is naming. So, in the 1885 census, I went through the whole census, census and I got everybody's name that had the word shield in it. And I think there was like, I can't remember, 47 or 37. I can't remember. I, I don't even want to count them right now. But this gives you a sense. So, for example, number 37, which is the age, that person was 37. Their name was Takes a Shield. They were named by somebody who captured a shield, who took a shield from somebody. Um, Number two, old, or the top one, old shield. Someone had a shield that probably had been in their family for a long, long time. They considered it a good thing, a holy object. It'll bring good fortune. They named that individual after that shield. Um, shows a shield um, is also could be translated as well-known shield. So shows and well-known and plain, for some reason, are the same word. So a well-known shield, or shows a shield, right? So that gives you kind of a sense, right? Okay, so in 1900, there was this many people that were still living who actively took part in the census, that should be said, that had the name with the shield. By, 19, by 1930, this is what we're down to. Now, why would that be? And look at the age. No one under the age of 50 is named after a shield. 
It's because the shields are no longer in the possession of crow people, so therefore those names, people are going to be named after shields. By 1930, Christianity takes a big role, so now a lot of the crow people's names are reflective of the new religion. Praise all the time. Shining crucifix. Things like that, right? This is a guy named Crazy Pondere, and that's his shield. It's in the field. I think this is coming too, this shield. So, I, the question I would get all the time is like, what would make crow people like get rid of the shields? Why would they sell them? So Spotted Tail, and we won't read the whole thing, um, he, he kind of gives you a sense that it wasn't as easy to get rid of these as, as it's thought of. He says, before he gives the shit out, he basically hands it to each member of his family and they pray with it before he sells it to Sims. And if you read this, he says, you know, he, he, his eyes get moistened, he says a prayer, and he passes it to the wife first, which her name is Cattail Reed Woman. Bimma Bewea. And um, that's the woman who named my grandfather, gave him his crow name, was this man's wife. And so then he passes it to the eldest of the two girls, and then passes it to the second one. They say their goodbyes. Kind of sad, really, you know. And that's a field photo taken by Sims. The reason this is important is because that's the top picture of Spotted Tail later in his life. And if you look at this, he's still a Crow Indian. You know, he kind of still sees it, sells his objects, his holy objects. He sold everything, you know. And then now he's just kind of an old cowboy looking guy, maybe a farmer. But that's his daughter in the middle, his wife on the right, and an adopted child there on the, on the far right. The girl in the middle is my great grandmother, Cordelia Spotted Tail. So if we look at this next photo, this woman right here is my mother. And this is what they call, they call Grandma Big Man, right? Because she, she was married to Max Big Man, a famous Crow Indian guy. Why this is important is because I'm now holding the shield. And this is what he told Sims. He told, told the shield, he said, um, we've carried you for a long time, but now we'll part forever, but memories will remain. This is important because over 100 years later, I'm holding the shield again. It's, it was pretty emotional at the time. That's weird, I'm wearing the same shirt. I didn't plan, I didn't plan that. I didn't, oh, I'm wearing the same hat. I did not plan that. Um, and a couple months ago, my daughter's class was asked to draw shields, European shields, crest, emblems, and she said, I don't want to draw that. Dad, do we have something? And I started talking to her, and then she found the picture of me holding that shield, and she drew the shield as her family crest. So that's pretty cool to me. So. And that's it. There you go. Oh, I should keep this on, huh? Are we doing questions? Well, fortunately, we have a lot of shields to pick from, so it's completely arbitrary. It was just like, which ones would I like to see? There was a couple that we thought should be close because the families are big, and we thought maybe they should see those shields. Um, there was also some talk about like shields that we've that showed some diversity. You know, like there was really elaborate shields, pretty plain shields. So we kind of wanted some of that, but for the most part, it was, pre it was just, there was about four of us who got together and said, you pick your seven, you pick your seven, and we'll see, you know, what shows up. And so will, will the families themselves like, get an opportunity in private to meet with the Shields before the, the show opens? Is that, is that, that was never discussed. That's a good idea, though. Okay. Now you make me feel bad. There's a lot of, um, in this part, like, 
I, this is a tough part of my job is I'm an advocate for Crow belief. Unfortunately, the majority of Crow people now struggle with that because of our commitment to the church. And that's fine. I'm not saying anything negative about the church. So that also means there's a fear sometimes attached to some of these objects because of their commitment to the church and the beliefs of the church. So not only do we combat culture loss, we, we, we have to address a lot of those issues. So I could, I could see where people would want to see the shields, but I could also see a large group of people saying they don't want to go near them, they don't want to be by them. And that's just the way it is nowadays, you know. It's just, unfortunately, that's the way it is, so. Yeah, you could make one yourself and it would probably be plain. The only way to get the images and, and things like that is through fasting. Okay. Through the fasting practice. Okay. Maybe I should say, I didn't say that in there, huh? That's uh, I, implied I implied it. <laughs> Yeah, I tried to pare this down to about 40 minutes because it used to, it was long the first couple of times I did it. And then I just thought, well, that's a bit ridiculous. So, yes, sir. How many shields are there in Chicago? 44. Yeah, how many are Seven. Seven? Yep. Wow. Yeah, well, part of it would have to be, uh, there's like weird rules in museums, like how many traveling objects can go so there's there's more than just seven objects coming from Chicago so we had to make I think there can be an entire exhibit just on the shields you know and that's plenty but this this exhibit is pretty unreal so if you guys get a chance it's by far the best exhibit I've ever seen on native people it's it's powerful it's pretty powerful and, and, the, and the exhibit was uh, curated by the crowd yeah, mostly. mostly. There was contributions by other people, you know, um, museum experts and things like that. And then uh, a, a lady named Miranda Owens, who's a Paiute, she helped quite a bit with it. She d deserves a lot of credit for it, too. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, guys.